You know, it's difficult to experience something new and like it and know that this new experience goes against everything about your life. <laughs> Forgive me. There is Kendra, there is Ginning, and there is Abi. Abi I met when she was 18, she's now 50. Sorry. When I first met Kendra, she was doing accounting. And Ginning was doing geology. S stupid, ridiculous fields. I came to realize after a while that they keep coming to my classes, they sit, they don't really ask very many questions, but they sit. And um, I asked them what it is that they are doing in their life, and one says geology, the other says psychology, the other says accounting. I said, oh my God, how awful. And I asked myself if they were to continue coming to these classes and being exposed to these ideas, if they're not going to remain 18, soon they'll be 25, 26, all these ideas are going to live inside them. And they're sitting in a cubicle and punching in data. How's that going to work for them? How's that going to be in their life? And I realized they're going to be messed up. They're probably going to be medicated, some institution. <clears throat> so I grabbed them by the throat, metaphorically speaking, of course. I said, listen, you can't do accounting or geology or psychology. These are fields for losers. You gotta do philosophy. You gotta do humanities. And once you finish, they can start teaching. And what will happen is the ideas that live inside you can now be expressed in the classroom as well as in your everyday life. Your companions will be books and ideas. There'll be not very many conflicts inside you. You'll have other kinds of conflicts. But your job, the way you make money, is not going to be different than the stuff that live inside you. All three of them teach now. And the point I'm trying to make is the following. When the second moth experiences heat, he goes home. And while home, he feels that there is no heat, it's just coldness. He engages in conversation, but there is no inspiration, there is no heat. So every moth that returns gains a bit more information, a bit more experience, but the more information and the more experience contradict life. Okay? So it goes before the king and the king asks, so tell me about your journey. The first moth was right. Fire does illuminate, but he was wrong or it was incomplete because what the first moth missed is that fire also generates heat. You can make s'mores. You can go to Yosemite during winter and have a great time sitting by the fire. But the king moth knows that this particular experience is also incomplete. Imagine if a book came out. Now remember, the first moth created a community and following. And 
A million people followed the path of the first moth. Fire only illuminates. The second moth is charismatic enough to have his own following. Now you have two camps. One camp only believes that fire illuminates. The second camp believes fire not only illuminates, but also generates heat. Now what you have in society is two completely opposite camps. And they're willing to destroy one another. I don't know how many of you in this class are familiar with the history of the New Testament, especially the four Gospels. You have four very, 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 very different books. And the message in each, very, very different. And the portrayal and image of Jesus in each, very, very different. Okay. Imagine you're a community of Mark. There is no virgin birth in that book. Jesus doesn't say, I'm God, before Abraham I was, I am bread, I am light. He doesn't say any of that. You meet a man at the age of 30. But then you go forth and you look at the Gospel of Luke. And it's a very, very different story. Now the people in the Gospel of Mark don't believe in virgin births. But the Gospel of Luke people believe in virgin births. Now what you have is a fight. This is what happens when your knowledge is incomplete. So you know what the king does? The king says, it's a good discovery by the second moth, but let me kill him as well. Incomplete information that can contaminate. The third moth goes away. For whatever the reasons and other injustice of life, human biology, human psychology, Not only does the third moth experiences the illuminating fire, also experiences that the fire generates heat. In addition, has the capacity to get very, very, very close to fire. In fact, so close that his right wing is burnt. And he no longer can fly straight. Imagine you have a journal and you write your most secretive stories in that journal and you hide the journal in a vault under your mattress. And then by chance your companion or your kid brother, your mom or your dad or someone, as they're cleaning your room, they see it and human beings like Pandora are curious they open it and they begin to read. For all these years they have liked you. And they have liked you because they didn't know. And because they liked you, they would buy you flowers, they would take you to the movies, they would clean the house, a vacuum, do this, do that. But now they've been exposed to something and something about them has now burnt, damaged. They want to fly the way they've always fly, but they can no longer. They know too much, they see too much. And now every time they want to fly straight, they run into the wall. We are very lucky people that we are really not interested in anything very seriously. That we like to look Maybe once in a while I feel the heat of the thing that we look at, but we don't want to get too close. It's a little too dangerous. Add to it the fact that with every new valuable experience, we're like women. You get pregnant with emotions, with ideas, with imagination. And we are social animals, not only because we need other people to build a building, 
but we are social animals because life puts emotions in us and we want to share those emotions. We want to share our bodies. We want to share our thoughts. But you come to realize that the more you experience, the more intense and valuable your experiences, the lonelier you get. Many of you in this class have experienced it. I mean, there can't be any experience more traumatic or more beautiful than love and the way it breaks you. And once in a while you want to talk about your brokenness with other people only to realize language is just far too crude. It's not designed to express things that are so layered with meaning and emotions and passions. Language is good for, where can I find milk? What's my grade? That's all that language can do. So again, for those of you who uh, say, I really want to like understand Plato, don't take yourself too seriously. You don't want to. There is wisdom to the saying, you can't love two masters. It's very true. You can't go to the fire, get burnt, and go back to your life and live an ordinary life. It doesn't work that way. <clears throat> Unless you just are a really, really good, self-deceiving human being, and that's okay. We all need to survive life in some shape or form. Goes back to the king and says, let me tell you what fire is. Illuminates, it's hot, and it burns you. The king says, no, wrong, kill him. Now that's a good teacher. You run away from fire because it's painful. We're not animals who enjoy pain. We like pleasure, but not pain. For those of you who have headaches once in a while, what do you do? Take a pill. For those of you who have unresolved histories, what do you do? Therapy. Whatever your issues are, you want them to be solved. We don't enjoy unresolved issues. None of us do. The fourth one goes away, sees light, sees heat, gets burnt. Dard bar man rizu darmana ma kon chun ke dard tu ze darman khosh dar ast. I've come to the fire, I've experienced it burning me, but despite the pain, there is something profoundly enjoyable about it. I want more. And so, unlike the previous three moths, this fourth and last moth goes inside the flame. Gets consumed by the flame. And like all fairy tales, the moth comes out but it's no longer a moth. It looks like a moth, but it really is fire. And doesn't inspire people to just look at the moth or look at fire. It doesn't inspire people to only look at the fire and feel the heat. It doesn't inspire people to only look at fire, experience the heat or the burn, but demands that people become consumed fly into the fire. That's the only way change is possible. So now let me tell you, there are four students therefore, but remember how students are made. You live in the dark. Meaninglessness, futility, doubts, confusion. Then you have four different kinds of students who have four different capacities. How? Why? No one knows. 
You don't go to the Laker game because you want to watch all the players. You only go there to watch LeBron James. 20 people on the court, your eyes only focus on LeBron. That's it. Why? How? Who the hell knows? It's magic, and it's a curious thing, best to be left unknown. You also have four different kinds of teachers. You have a teacher who tells you what fire looks like, draws you a picture on the board, and you can see the flame dancing before your eyes. And the picture will inspire imagination, will inspire curiosities. You will go to the bookstore and buy books about fire. That's one kind of a teacher. Okay? But remember, that kind of a teacher was only the first kind of a student. He only had the capacity to go on this journey to a certain distance and only to look at the fire. Nothing more. The second kind of a teacher is he or she is simply not satisfied with simply showing you fire. They will manipulate, they will coerce, they will play all sorts of tricks so that you could be inspired, you could desire to maybe just get a little bit closer. You can feel the heat that when you go home, you think about this person or the idea. It's not leaving you alone. But the first two teachers do not have the tools to have you complete the journey, whatever the journey may be. Then you have another kind of a teacher shows you what fire is, manipulates you into feeling what the fire does to your psyche a little bit, and then manipulates and exploits you a bit more, brainwashes you a bit more, and then you realize when you hang out with your friends, the only thing you talk about is philosophy. And your friends look at you and say, what happened to you? You used to be so much fun. You're so boring now. We used to smoke together. Now, nothing. You don't drink, you don't smoke. You're just serious. There is no laughter. Everything you touch dies. What's wrong with you? And then you have the fourth teacher, Carlos Casaneda and Don Juan looks at this old man, doesn't know why, doesn't know how, but he feels something. And out of nervousness, he just rambles on and on and on for three, four, five, six hours. But goes home, you see, Carlos does, and says, I can't get rid of the image of this man. What has he done to me? Why do I think about him? <coughs> And then he leaves his home in Los Angeles and goes in pursuit of finding this man and eventually does spend some time with him and gets burnt, man. Can't focus on his life, can't focus on his relationships, is afraid of his future, of his academic. And you know what he does? He looks at this man and says, you're too much, I can't do it, I'm out. But there is something inside Kassanada and says, it's not enough. Go back. You've rested enough. And you know what Kassanada does? Goes back. After a year or two of absence, finds the man and works with him for the next few years. Now, let me tell you what a good teacher and a good student look like. Kassanada goes underground. 
There are lots of stories about him, fine. But you don't find interviews. You don't find YouTubes. You have lots of people saying lots of things about him. But Castaneda honors the verse in one of the Gospels. Do not give your jewels before swines or throw your jewels before swines. Now, all of us in this class assume that we have something special. We don't. All we have are assumptions. Castaneda is a guy who's been there, who's done that, who's been in the fire. He doesn't just do drugs. He does drugs with the culture itself. He knows the culture of the plants. He knows the culture of the roots. He doesn't sit in his room and smoke weed like some stupid guy. Because he knows smoking without culture is just a disease. You appropriate the worst thing of a culture and you dismiss the rest. That's the story. I know it was very short. <laughs> and not very detailed, but... Anna. Um, I want to ask if you've ever, like, like, in your own personal experience, like, experienced the power that Carlos Castaneda found with Don Juan. Is that like a personal question? Yeah. And you want me to tell you a personal story? Yeah. No. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what? Because if you're so annoying sometimes. Oh. It's because he's a troll. <laughs> it's a good movie, isn't it? Um, I like Branch. He's like Eeyore. Uh, Have you found your own Don Carlos? I think it's a good question. Has Professor found his own Don Carlos? Oh, no, I mean, like, the actual, like, power in the book. Have you experienced it? Have you been into the flame? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean... Am I flammable? Sure. <laughs> Can I tell you a story? Sure. Uh, there is a guy, I think he's around the 12th century. He weren't around then, neither was I, but nevertheless. His name is Fariduddin Attar. Heard of him? You come to this class with, just kidding. Attar had a shop, an Attari shop. He was from Neshabur. Do you know where it is? You come to this class with so poor. He was a perfume maker. He would wake up at three in the morning, go to his shop and just concoct a few things and then come out and spray people. So um, one day as he has made this brand new perfume, he goes out and he sprays someone. And he had this awful habit of spraying and then giving a long commentary as to how he made it and why they should like it. And so on this particular occasion, as he sprays someone wet with this perfume, he's about to give this long-winded commentary. And this old man who just went by the name Dervish, do you know what that means? He slaps him. I mean, this is the Middle East, so slapping is permissible, especially in the 12th century. Slaps him and says, That perfume has a language of its own. If you put some perfume on me, my nose will tell me if I like it or not. I don't need your language. I don't need your commentary. And so... 
this old man looks at this young kid, the perfume maker, and says, why do you waste your life making people smell good on the outside when they are decaying on the inside? Huh? And Atar, being a young kid, like all young kids, he says, I don't understand. And you can bring a whole host of ideas. Karl Marx and his idea of alienation, the Garden of Eden, and we have been expelled, and down here there is nothing but blood and sweat and futility and all that. Or the last few verses of the Gospel of Mark, let the dead bury the dead, all that stuff. It's just common to all people, all places, that the sort of life that we usually have, it makes us look good on the outside, smell good on the outside, but on the inside, if you look very, very closely, it's just a corpse. It's Persian. It's beautiful. You know, uh, when I first met my wife, she didn't like me. She still doesn't. And every time I, I feel like she wants to harass me. And she harasses me quite often, as women must harass their men, because men, for the most part, are profoundly immature, but all that aside, the moment I, I feel like I'm going to be abused even more, I look at her, I gaze into her eyes, and I say, Vishnu has nature in Hekayat And she says, Amir, I love you. <laughs> That's the power of Persian poetry. What did you tell her? It's a curse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And then Atar gives up his shop and goes on this quest to figure out what the meaning of life is, and eventually finds it, and writes about five or six books. Elahi Nameh, Asrar Nameh, the most famous Mantagotair. The journey that some human beings take, they have to go through seven valleys or seven stages or seven countries to ultimately find what it is that they're looking for. One is pain, one is longing, one is poverty, one is complete annihilation or emptiness. So I'm, I'm not really quite sure what your question was. Uh, so just be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. Which author are you? Well, my, my parents, when they first came here and they realized that I didn't go to school, they were very upset. They said, go get your degree in anything. Garbage cleaning, I don't really care, just get a degree. So I just went to school and got a degree. I don't really like philosophy, I never enjoyed philosophy, but um, it was something that pleased my parents. She just got a degree. I don't care about the ideas. Um, I mean, I, I, I feel a good amount of distance between myself and the ideas. So, um, just like any old chap. Read a couple of books, come to class, say a couple of ridiculous things, and go home. Oh yeah, what well, I was going to say to both of your questions. If you have to ask what moth are you, or have you had, I don't know, experience with whatever it is that you were talking about, I think it'd be silly to ask people who they are, what they are. Just sit back and listen to them. And I think you have spidey senses, everyone does, you know, and you can kind of intuit for yourself. If the idea is being expressed of any value, any sincerity, any honesty, if you walk away feeling that there is a hint of sincerity to them, then well, maybe you have your answer. If on the other hand your intuition says no, well, there is your answer. But there are moments where you feel as if you know, time passes, you realize your feelings are wrong. And uh, so you have to kind of give yourself some, you know, extra cushion room. Just in case you're wrong, you can go back and correct. Anyone else? We have time for like a few quickies. And America is a land of quickies, so yeah. 
are there are there universal truths such as and when I ask you who are you, if you ask me who am I, then the universal truth is. You know, it's and an. If so, and if so, can they be said? Okay, <clears throat> universal truths. Um, You know, it's an interesting question, and I think there are stages to uh, responding to your questions or the different levels of answering your question. The Inuits are interesting people, and it's, it's something that I read and experienced many, many, many years ago. Um, Eskimos, at least a category of, of that particular community, they are nomads, they move around constantly. And when you move around, you don't really create a relationship with the land. You also, if you're a young mother and you have two, three, four, five kids, you usually nurse them almost up to the age four or five, okay? Now, sometimes a woman has only so much milk to give. And as you're moving, what happens is you realize you have an infant, you have a two-year-old, you have a five-year-old, and you have a 10-year-old. And you have to nurse all of them. Okay. By the time you get to your two-year-old or your infant, you realize there is no milk left. Now, there is a custom, a ritual in that tradition. You leave your kid in the snow to die. How they grieve the loss of their child is a different story. Sometimes they leave their parents, their elders, who can't walk, who have difficulty moving around. They leave them to die. There is no component of shame or guilt or remorse. Now, if your question is, do, is grieving universal? The answer is yes. If your next question is, is there a universal way of grieving? The answer is no. And why do we grieve? Well, whenever you have a relationship with something, anything, and remember what a relationship means. No. No. You don't have to be in love with it. Uh, uh, Frida's parents hated one another. When you spend time with anything, time, time, you get used to them. You form habits, physical habits, emotional habits, intellectual habits. You long to go home and fight with your spouse, even though you hate fighting. And when she's not there, you say, ah, I miss the fight. And when she dies, very much like Frida's parents, you know, you sit by your father and say, Dad, do you miss mom? I miss the fighting. Now, if your relationship is long, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, your grieving period is going to be longer. You have your own rituals. If, on the other hand, you just found this man and you've been with him for like two weeks, but you're attractive enough to have other flies on your plate, you know, I say, oh, he was a nice chap, but he hasn't called me. Ah, screw it. So, <sighs> the other side, there is another perhaps universal truth is the moment your eyes open, whether it's instinctual, whether it's intuitive, whether it's biological, I don't really know. All human beings have one thing in common, and that's hope. Hope branches out into happiness, into meaning, into relevance, into identity. Hope. You're in Gaza, bombs are being dropped, you hope. You're going through a divorce, you hope. You're divorced because of hope. Now, if you have lost your hope, depending on how chronic, how deep-rooted it is, you get depressed. And it's something we'll talk about at a different day. Yes, it is, it is, there are some universal things. Now, if your question is, can it be expressed, it depends what it is. And how have you unpacked your experience? Because what usually happens, for the most part, really, when you go to therapy, 
what you want your therapist to do is you want your therapist to unpack this puzzle. You want to see each of these pieces. And the problem with therapy or try desiring to see the pieces is that every single piece has its own world of emotions, hopes, and disappointments. And it's sometimes too much. You know, I mean, consider for a moment uh, The Sopranos. I think it's like the first or second episode of the first season where he has everything. He's just unhappy, you know, and he goes and sees this very attractive therapist. You know, I think her name was Taylor Swift, right? And there is a scene where he says, well, you know, are you the way you are because of your mom? Now, if you happen to come from the Italian culture, you know, the French culture, Middle Eastern culture, African culture, Indian culture, no one is allowed to talk about your mom, you know? And, uh, and you realize the moment, you know, someone tries to unpack something about your past and you see too much and you feel too much, very much like the moths, you say, no, no, I, I don't want that. But ultimately, uh, whatever it is that you want to understand, no one can hold your hand. You have to go through the journey yourself. And that's really painful. And you should never do it alone. Never alone. Never alone. Yeah, yeah. Rave on. Anything? Yeah. Did you paint your nails? <laughs> you think I got time for that? You think you think I like this? When you have children, <laughs> you're a slave to your kids. Dad, dance. Okay. Dad, dad, I just pooped. Can you eat that? Okay. That's what you do. You know why I did this? So when I end up in a nursing home, she can come visit me. <laughs> Be clever. <laughs> Anyone else? And just in case she doesn't, you know, of course, say, honey, remember when you painted my nails? Oh, dad, I haven't seen you for 10 years. I'll come by tomorrow. Guilt. Anyone else? Well, it's good to see all of you. Remember, um, don't think about the ideas we talk about in class. You know, it's not good for you. Have a nice weekend. Tell your parents I said hi. Thank you. Thank you.